Hello, everyone, and welcome to ALS m and Connect 2021. I'm, my name is Kathy Cummings. I'm the Executive Director of the International Alliance of ALS m and Associations, and I apologize for that little pause. I have my grand cat here with me, and she decided to step on my computer just as I was starting to speak, of course. Uh, I would like to welcome you to this uh, fantastic uh, panel of uh, international researchers who are going to bring us the latest and greatest uh, updates and uh, what's happening in the research field. And I really want to thank our sponsors who make all of this possible. Uh, we had some fantastic partner sponsors for all of our uh, meetings that we've held over the last month. Uh, we have uh, Biogen, MT Pharma, Amelix, UCB, Apellus, and our foundational sponsor, Cytokinetics, that have enabled us to do this. We also have some sponsors specific to ALS m and Connect. We have Brainstorm, Biogen, and Amelix, and we really appreciate their support. We couldn't do what we do without the support of our industry partners. Today, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Felipe Ocampo to kick things off uh, for ALS m and Connect. Uh, Felipe is a medical surgeon who currently resides in California with his uh, husband and five dogs. And um, I'll let him tell his own story uh, about his diagnosis with ALS m and uh, in February of 2021. And uh, he's a huge supporter of research. So Without further ado, let's hear from Dr. Felipe Ocampo. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this ALS MND Connect. My name is Felipe Ocampo. I am an American surgeon, and I have been living with ALS MND for nine months. This is an honor to speak to you today. Thank you for having me. My journey started when I started losing my strength on one of my hands. I thought maybe my body was tired because I would exercise every day and I would lift weight on my daily basis. I thought maybe it was a strain. Time keeps passing and I was not getting better. From my medical background, I knew it was not normal and something else was going on with my body. I visited my doctor and explained my issues and how I was losing strength and have fasciculation on my arms. She said, I will be okay, and that is what maybe from a muscle strength. After that visit, I was not getting better and I started to really worry and needed to find out. Different tests. I was diagnosed with ALS MND in February of 2021. So my first reaction was go to my laptop and search the internet about ALS MND as I did not know the death of this disease. The first thing I found was that my life is going to be over in two or five years. Really scary information as I felt my life was over. However, I only had two options, waiting to die or start 
fighting against it. I joined some ALS in the association and I found out that this disease is different in everyone. Besides, it is possible to live more than five years. That's why research is really important. We can learn more about this disease and how to treat it. There is not too much trustworthy information out there or accessible sometimes. Any new data is going to bring benefits to people and science. We want a future with, a, with not ALS MND. Thank you to everybody who invests time on research. Thank you so much, Felipe, for that reminder of why research is so important. Uh, it's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Nortina Shahrazalia from Malaysia. Um, Nortina is uh, a graduate of the University of Nottingham Medical School in 1997. She completed her general medical training, specialist neurology, and doctorate degree in the UK before, before returning to Malaysia in 2009. As part, as part of her specialist neurology and neurophysiology training, she worked at a tertiary neurology center, including Queen's Medical Center, Nottingham, and the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, Neurosurgery Queen Square, London. She is currently a consultant neurologist at the University of Malaya Medical Center, as well as a professor of neurology at the University of Malaya. She has a subspecialty clinical and research interest in the field of neuromuscular disorders and motor neuron disease, uh, ALS. Nortina is also um, uh, fully engaged and is the chair of PACTELS currently, I believe, she can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, which is the Asia Pacific Consortium for uh, ALS. And without further ado, I'll turn the program over to uh, Nortina. Thank you, Nortina. Thanks very much, Kathy. Hello, everyone. I think I should correct you, though, Kathy, that I'm not technically the chair of Pectels. I kind of like help out with, you know, the running of, of Pectels, which is the Asia Pacific ELS group. It's actually Dr. Seung Kim, who's, who's currently the president. But anyway, it's not about me. So I have the pleasure. I wanted to just thank the um, International Alliance of ALS MND and specifically Kathy for, for inviting uh, me to moderate this session. I'm really very excited to to do this we've got three fantastic speakers and i'd first of all I'd like to introduce our first speaker which is professor orla hardiman so professor hardiman is professor of neurology and head of the academic unit of neurology at trinity college dublin and she's also a consultant neurologist at beaumont hospital where she is director of the national als service she's a practicing neurologist for over 30 years she also leads a research group of 50 individuals in neurodegeneration, particularly focusing on ALS MND. She is currently the co-chair of the European Network for Cure of ALS, NCALS, and also the European Treatment Initiative to Cure ALS, which is the TRICALS. And she's also editor-in-chief of the journal ALS FTD. So Professor Hardiman today is going to talk to us about ALS research, Time for Optimism. Over to you, Professor Hardiman. Hello, my name is Orla Hardiman. I'm Professor of Neurology in Trinity College Dublin. And I'm going to talk today about why there's grounds now for great optimism with respect to our research into ALS or motor neuron disease. We know that ALS is a complex disorder and we know that there are probably genetic factors um, and that these probably interact with environmental factors that lead to the cause of the disease. Some people carry a single gene and then other factors might uh, happen during their life that leads them to develop the disease. In some genes, it's a large number of factors. In some genes, it's a small number of factors. Then there's time, and then eventually the disease develops. And our understanding of how this happens is much greater than it was in the past. 
What do we know about the genes? Well, there's been a, a, a significant advance in our understanding of the genetic associations with motor neurons, disease, starting back with our discovery of SOD1 in 1994, and then with the evolution of technology and computational abilities, it's now possible to, to sequence a whole human gene and then to identify genetic variants that might be associated with the disease. And there are many different ways that this has been done over the years, as, this, as shown up here in this slide. But it, really about 30 genes have been identified that have a significant and credible association with the disease. But of these 30 genes, probably only four are, are, are really very important, particularly in populations of European extraction. Now, this might differ in populations outside of Europe because we don't have as much information um, about people who, who aren't of European extraction. It does look like that ALS and motor neurons is as commoner in people who come from, from European um, ancestor origins. The four genes that are important are SOD1, TDP43, FUS, and one the most important of all, which accounts for about 10% of ALS in European populations, and about half of all the familial forms of motor neuron disease, or ALS, is C9 or 72 and Of course, we know that that's also related to uh, some forms of dementia. Understanding what these genes might do to lead to the disease has, has led to a lot of different ways that we can look at the causes of the disease and a lot of animal work and, and, and cellular work within the laboratory has really identified um, quite a number of different pathways and mechanisms by which the disease can occur, ranging from uh, problems in, in how we repair our DNA through how we translate or, or transcribe the DNA into forming of proteins, how these proteins are removed from the nucleus, how the proteins within the cell remain um, stable, how our energy metabolism works within our cell, uh, within our cells, and how if there's a damage to that energy metabolism that can lead to disruptions, um, how how pa uh, patterns of transport of of important materials up and down the nerve and um, cable uh, can get disrupted, and and how the cellular environment, not just the, the neurons, but the other cells within the nervous system might be disrupted, um, leading to inflammation. And all of these pathways are probably important, but they may be different in different patients. So some people may have one set of pathways that are really important and that are mediated by genetic variants, and others may have other pathways. And one of the challenges that we need to understand is how these different pathways interact and how important they are in some people versus others. And, and it's likely that we'll be able to segregate people over time into different subgroups based on some of these different pathways. One of the ways that we've been able to do this up to now is to is to really model this in, in laboratory settings. And there's been many, many different ways that this has been done over the years, uh, using um, uh, mice that carry the, some of the human genes, particularly the SOD1 gene, to um, taking um, uh, neurons from the mouse and growing them in cell culture, and most recently uh, taking pieces of skin and turning the cells from the skin into um, neurons and then looking to see what sort of damage might occur in those cultures from human motor neurons. Um, and all of these different models have, have led to huge information, huge, huge um, uh, develops in, into our developments into our understanding of the disease. I suppose the most important um, model that we've had for the, over the past 20 odd or, or almost 30 years now has been the, the mouse with motor neurons, disease, the SOD1 mouse. And the mouse has been used extensively to test for new drugs, to see if the drug works and to see if the drug is toxic. And that's led to many, many, many uh, drug trials. Um, and, and, and some of the pathways that have been targeted are shown on this cartoon here, um, where we, we've had a lot of insight into how the, the neural nervous system within the SOD1 mouse becomes disrupted to the cells within the nervous system, and what sort of drugs that we might be able to use to, to interfere with that disruption and, and, and um, prevent the disease from progressing in the mice. And we've been pretty good at doing that. There, there are many, many drugs now that work quite well in the mouse model. The difficulty, of course, is that these drugs that have worked very well in the mouse haven't always translated into working well in, in the human condition. And this is what we call the valley of death, where we, we can be very good at 
looking at mechanisms and targeting new drugs within a cellular environment or even within a small animal environment like the mouse, and then bringing that into the human domain where, where I work, where um, we try these drugs in people with the disease, um, has been a little bit more disappointing. And all of the drugs that I showed on that cartoon um, um, have not been effective in humans, which is which could be perceived as being very disappointing. But what, what we've done there is we've learned from our mistakes. We know now that there are lots of problems in using a mouse and turning that mouse information into human information. And that's because the anatomy of the mouse differs from the anatomy of humans. And of course, mice are, are born and reared in a laboratory, so their, their genetic background is very similar, whereas in humans, the genetic background is quite different. And of course, we put lots of different gene variants into the mouse, lots of different copies of the human gene, whereas in fact, humans only have one copy of the gene, so that, that's the, the, the way that that gene abnormality might lead to disease might be a little bit different in humans. So part of the thing that we've understood now and part of the progress has been made has, our under, has been our understanding of the, the fact that translating from mice into humans is probably not um, a linear thing, that it, it, we can learn lots of things about the mouse, but turning that into um, a treatment that works in humans is probably a little bit over optimistic and there's a lot more work that we need to do. So we need to stop doing these studies where we're just testing the drug in mice and then translating that drug into humans and expecting the drug to work in humans. Now, we did this for a long time over the years. We kept on doing the same things. So, well, maybe this drug will work in the, in the human because it worked in the mouse. And that was what Albert Einstein defined as definition of insanity that we kept on doing the same thing over and over again, again and expected to get a different result. So I think now things are moving and we understand now the complexity of ALS or motor neurone disease in humans and, and some of that complexity is a function of course of the fact that we're more that were more complex brains than, for example, the brain in the fly, which is a food fly that we still use for modeling, or the brain in the mouse. And these animal models can give us a lot of information, a lot of insights. But, but we need to be, I suppose, a little bit more humble in when we translate into the complexity of the human condition. What we need to do is take a, take a really, I suppose, a precision medicine approach towards uh, developing new treatments. And precision medicine is a bit of a buzzword. Um, it means that we're tailoring medical treatments to the individual characteristics of the patient or the individual characteristics of the disease in that patient. So it allows us to classify people into subgroups that then differ in their susceptibility to a particular disease and in the, the uh, biological process that underpin that disease. Of course, precision medicine has been very successful in other conditions like cancer. And what we need to do is to move that approach into the much more complex disorders that are the disorders of the human nervous system. That's because we have a very complex system of causes where there are, there are genetic factors and there are environmental factors. There's a passage of time, there's aging, and there's, there are many factors here that we don't really understand very well, but that we need to, to study to a greater extent. What we do know, though, is that if we, if we take a precision medicine approach, the likelihood is that we would be able to separate people into different subgroups. And these different subgroups may well require different types of treatments. And the challenge for us is to learn how to do that so that we can identify these small clusters of people with different types of motor neuron disease that we can then bring forward for different types of treatments. So our mission is to develop the right drug for the right patient in the right time at the right dose. So have we been able to do that in clinical trials? Well, of course, in the past, it hasn't been very successful. We've had 40 or 50 trials that have, have had looked like they're very promising, but turned out to be negative. We know now that this animal-based approach isn't always the best approach to take, and that we need to really think about um, different subgroups of patients uh, with different types of um, processes that are leading to disease and possibly different pathways that are causing the disease that we might be able to target differently. And the ways that we need to do that are to be able to identify these people using what we would call biomarkers or markers of the different subtypes of the disease. So we need to do that. And we also need to understand the mistakes that are made in, in clinical trial design and outcome measures. And I think we'll be discussing this um, during this present these presentations as well. 
So what about the present? Well, it's a, it, the future is bright. The present is bright as well. There are many, many, many uh, compounds that are, are in current clinical trial in phase one or phase two or some phase three trials, which means that um, the phase three trials are the ones that are will tell us whether the drug is really working and whether the drug might come to the market in the near future. Um, so there's a lot of interest in the pharma industry in motor neuron disease, which is which is, is wonderful because seven or eight or ten years ago that just wasn't the case. So we've many, many more trials um, coming along and in fact some of the concerns are that there are more trials and there are patients now, which is which is a, a good place the future will be to have better ways of selecting people for trials and better targeting treatments, like I said. And some of the ways that we do that, we know, or some of the ways that we can do that, we know. So, for example, we're better now at being able to predict whether somebody is going to move very slow or very fast in their disease uh, because my colleagues in Utrecht developed this prediction model called the NCALS prediction model, which can provide a probability of prognosis for the person. Now, obviously, that can be um, upsetting for people as well. But it does allow us to use a number of factors that we can discern in a clinical setting and, and then to determine um, whether the person will be moving really, really slowly and therefore would be difficult to enroll in a trial or moving at a moderate pace would be suitable for a trial. And that would be what we would call the eligibility range for the trial. And we can do this very effectively now um, and we have some trials that are, are going to be using this model. Now, the survival model can break groups of people into different subgroups. Some people, unfortunately, might have a very rapid progression, but some people may have, may have a very slow progression. And the objective would be to um, enter people into trials based on the likely progression of their disease. And, and when we look at um, the prediction model and how it might have been used in clinical trials in the past, we can see that even though we try to enroll people based on what we thought was the likely progression of, of their disease. Uh, we didn't get that very, we weren't very good at doing that because we can see that many of these trials that were done, and this is worked by Ruben van Eyck and Leonard Vandenberg from Utrecht, um, they contain patients with lots of different probabilities of, of disease progression. And of course, that makes it very difficult to assess the trial because we have a lot of what we would call heterogeneity or variability within the patient population. Now, if we, if we look at how many patients we exclude in trials and, and have we been able to um, improve the exclusion rate, the number of people that we don't let into trials for various reasons. Unfortunately, we haven't been very good at doing that. So of the trials that we've engaged in over the years, we've excluded maybe 60% of people who, who, um, who, might be, who might have benefited from the drug, from the treatment, um, were the treatment to work. Um, we can do better with that with some of these new models of prediction that we have. So on average, up to in the previous trials that we've done, 60% of people were excluded before we even got to enroll them into trials. And unfortunately, over the years, there wasn't really an improvement in that, even though we tried very hard to do that based on looking at previous trials and see if we could re refine the criteria for entry into clinical trials. There's a, very, there's a great deal of variability across the trials, across, for example, the Idaramone trial, which led to approval in the US, excluded about 90% of patients. And, uh, and by contrast, one of the, one of the cytokinetic studies, the Tirozentra trial, excluded about 50% of patients. So there's a huge variability in the percentage of people that we exclude in trials. Of course, we prefer to exclude nobody. Um, that, that is difficult if somebody is a very slowly progressive form of the disease, the way we measure disease progression at the moment makes it difficult to enroll these people. Now, the trials that we're currently enrolling in Europe, I've listed some of the major ones that are, that are, are in progress at the moment. And of these, the Lighthouse trial, which is using an uh, um, uh, anti-AIDS drug, and the Magnet study, which is a new study being developed by in, within um, the TriCALS group, both use this TriCALS prediction model um, rather than the old-fashioned way of enrolling people. So that's a really exciting develop development. There are also new designer treatments based on genetics, and that's really exciting as well. And there have been a number of studies now. Um, the Tofersen study that's targeted <clears throat> at SOD1, and there's a number of studies now also targeting the gene C9RF72. So this is true precision medicine. This is based on people who have the genetic variant, and we, we put in a treatment that turns off the gene, and the, hopefully that will slow the progression of the disease. So that's, that's a really exciting and important innovation development. We'll make a lot more progress, of course, if we all work together, because ALS is a rare 
disease and and we need to understand the disease in all of its iterations from genetic to the clinical progression from a genetic point of view of course we've all been working together now for a number of years in the project mind consortium and that's a way of looking at the genetic variants that are associated with ALS and motor neuron disease and there are many many countries involved in the project mind, mind consortium uh, where we take a sample of DNA from patients we put it into the project mind consortium and and um, each country then funds the analysis of the DNA from the patients within their, own, within their own country. And that's led to many, many new insights into our understanding of the causes of, of, of the likely cause of ALS. And Project Mine is, is, is moving apace and there'll be many presentations at the symposium um, on the new insights from Project Mine. We need to also capitalize on the way that we developed Project Mine. So Project Mine was a, a transnational collaboration um, involving 17 countries and um, we want to expand that to a global collaboration and then to translate these genetics into clinical studies and then using the project mine um, me mentality idea of cross-natural collaborations we want to develop these collaborations to understand aspects of the disease that aren't just genetic, genetic but the clinical aspects of the disease and the environmental factors that may lead to disease development and of course that's what we do in TRICAL's the treatment initiative cure, to cure ALS which is a group of 44 centres across Europe who are interested in clinical trials for people with ALS and interested in improving, improving trials and, and developing this new highway to a cure uh, for, for motor neuron disease or ALS across Europe. And within TRICALS we've developed five lanes of research that we want, in which we want to engage, including um, really developing information at scale by combining our different data sets, by developing new biomarkers, by improving clinical trial design, by putting this platform together where we can collect all the information in real time and interrogate it in real time. And of course, to be alive and sensitive to the needs of people with the disease and not just to move ahead with what we think is best, but to incorporate the views of the people who have the disease as well. So TRICALS has OIPALS um, as a member and the um, and a representative from OIPALS, Evie Revier, is on the board of TRICALS. I think group of trials. We want to do, be better at collecting our data and, and we're going to develop this pan-European um, electronic patient platform across the different sites in Europe. Uh, this is what it looks like, so we'll be collecting information from people with ALS and then collecting as much as we can about those patients on this patient data platform so that we can then start undertaking very detailed analysis at a very large scale. And I'm pleased to say that this is actually funded uh, through a program with, within Ireland in collaboration um, with colleagues within the TRICALS group and with some funding sources from, provided to the um, Irish um, Exchequer. It's very important, like I said, that we recognise the needs um, and values of people who have the disease so that we understand the experience of the illness beyond what's actually happening at a pathological level, but what's happening to the person and their family as they experience the disease. So a really important part of what we do is to have the patients and their families as collaborative partners in these projects and to really understand the meaningfulness of the, the outcomes that we measure and also to incorporate outcomes that are important to the patients and their families using these new technologies that we've been developing, of course, as a response to COVID as much as anything else, but to reduce the burden of collecting information um, on people when we're doing this in our, in our clinical practice, but also in the context of new clinical trials. So to conclude, we know that ALS is a complex condition, that people with ALS have different subtypes. That's really important insight. It's something that we, we hadn't really incorporated into our understanding of the disease and how we manage disease and how we uh, think about developing new treatments for the disease. So recognising that is very important. The complexity of the disease requires that we work together and that will help to speed things up in terms of new drug development. And then these new, there are definitely new and more effective treatments on the horizon. And I think there is grounds now to be really optimistic about the work that's happening today so that tomorrow I think that we'll have better and more effective treatments. Right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hardiman, for that talk and telling us all about the state of the art with respect to developing new treatments. 
Uh, our next speaker is um, Dr. Terry Hyman Petson. Um, Dr. Hyman Petson is Professor of Neurology at the Louise Katz School of Medicine at Temple University, where she is Director of the Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases and for the MDA ALS Center of Hope. She's board certified in neurology with subspecialty certification in neuromuscular diseases. Her research has focused on ALS and includes both clinical and laboratory interests. She is president and co-founder of the ALS Hope Foundation, which is a nonprofit committed to making a difference to people living with ALS. She's committed to patient care and education, actively participating in the Clinical Research Learning Institute to train PELS to be research advocates. So Dr. Hyman Petson is going to be talking to us about genetics, providing insights into ALS disease mechanisms and targeted treatments. Hi, my name is Terry Hyman Patterson, and this is a real privilege to be here to talk to you about the genetic landscape of ALS and how it has helped to inform us on disease mechanism and inform us on developing treatment strategies. Today, we're going to talk about all of this, as well as cell-based and animal models of ALS. So 10% of ALS is familial. What do we mean by that? It means that there's a family history of someone else in the family having had the disease. The first gene that we identified was the SOD1 gene in 1993 uh, that, uh, when mutated, caused disease. Approximately 20% of familial ALS can be explained by mutations in the SOD1 gene, and there have been more than 187 different mutations found. Of import is that even 1% to 2% of sporadic ALS folks can harbor a mutation in the SOD1 gene. This gene also shows complexity and variability even within families, so that within a family, where the SOD1 gene tracks with disease, one can see two family members with the same mutation, but yet having very different clinical disease, different onset, and different survival. This suggests that there are other factors that modify disease, including genetic factors and uh, perhaps environmental factors, as well as, well as aging. Certainly, this has provided the nidus from my research, which is in the genetic modifiers uh, of ALS in animal models and helping to translate that to people. And I hope to have some time to talk about that at the end of this talk. Well, we got SOD1 in 1993, but the discovery of genes has really accelerated over the last 10 to 15 years. And you can see that in this, this graph where just from 2008 on, it, it's been an explosion. And now more than 42 different genes have been identified that uh, are associated with ALS. And this accounts for more than 70% of the genetic component of familial ALS. And why have we had such an acceleration? It's really been due to technological advancements. The first thing was uh, the sequencing of the human genome uh, in around 2000 led to the ability to really database and data query on changes that were in the genome that could be tracking with ALS and where they were located and in what genes. The sequencing speed, how fast we could sequence somebody's genome and how cheaply was one of the next advancements, the use of different techniques like genome-wide association, whole exome, and whole genome sequencing and comparing affected and control individuals and the speed that we could do that, and the improvement in statistical techniques applied to those uh, methodologies, all have helped to really accelerate. And just in the last five years, there have been 11 genes identified. If one looks at the distribution of the genetic changes in familial ALS, you can see that we can identify a genetic underpinning 
uh, and what particular gene is affected in almost 70% of cases. I also want to point out that in 10 to 15%, this says 11%, we identify genetic changes in the sporadic population where there's no family history. The most common of all of the genetic defects has been the C9 open reading frame 72 uh, gene. In this gene, it isn't a change in the sequence of the coding region, but rather an extra piece of DNA inserted in uncoded region. That is regions of the DNA that don't necessarily translate to the working protein C9ORF72. But as a result of this increased piece of DNA, there ends up being translated proteins called dipeptide repeats that end up glomming up the cell. They affect nuclear transport, nucleocytoplasmic transport, and they also cause aggregation within the cytoplasm. And there's a possible toxic gain of function. And it does make up 40% of familial ALS, and importantly, 4 to 7% of sporadic ALS. And if we can find a treatment for C9, we will be able to help virtually 15 to 20% of all ALS. Think about that. And, and so understanding these genetic changes and getting therapeutic approaches is going to be extremely important, not only for familial ALS, but for sporadic ALS. Similarly, you can see the distribution of some of the other genes that have been identified. And I should comment that different populations have different distributions of genetic abnormalities. To add to the complexity, so we have 42 genes. We have families where even within the same family, the same mutation can look very different. And here we see that there are families that actually harbor two different affected genes, two different mutated genes. So that clearly there's even influence between those genes. We've also identified a gene called ataxin 2, which can modify the presentation of uh, ALS. Uh, ataxin is also a repeat disease where there's an increased piece of DNA. If that piece of DNA is big enough, you get an ataxia. But if it's only increased moderately, it can alter the way ALS looks. And in fact, there are some treatment strategies for people who carry that uh, extra piece of uh, DNA in their ataxin gene. There's treatment strategies that are directed at, at that as well. So it's a very complex interaction. Uh, and the more we understand, the more we'll be able to direct treatment, both for sporadic and for uh, familial ALS. To add to all of this, ALS is on a continuum with other neurodegenerative diseases, one of which is frontotemporal dementia. And there's a relationship here. 40 to 50% of people with ALS have cognitive involvement. It can be very mild. Five to 10% have frank frontotemporal dementia. And it turns out that ALS and frontotemporal dementia not only share pathologic changes, specifically protein aggregates with mislocalized TDP43. This is a very important protein in a few, in a small number of familial ALS cases, there's actually a mutation, but in virtually all ALS folks, be sporadic or familial, there is clumping or aggregation of this protein, and the protein is mislocalized in the cell. It's supposed to be found in the nucleus, but it ends up in the cytoplasm and clumped. That same pathologic finding is seen in FTD. Again, a shared pathologic change. Furthermore, there are genes that are shared and can result in either FTD or ALS. And probably the most common one that we pay attention to is that C9 gene, but certainly FUS, TDP43. And you can see a whole list of them uh, that we don't have to list or mention. I just want to impress that there is a huge overlap even genetically 
between these two diseases. And we come up with this whole picture. It's very complex. I think Dr. Hardiman alluded to that, that ALS is an interplay between uh, your genetic endowment, aging, and your exposures over time, probably some chance. So very complex. And the more we understand, the more we'll be able to design appropriate treatments and even prevention. But I always like to say that the genetic changes in ALS have led to an understanding of motor neuron biology gene by gene. And there's also been targeted several important pathways that these mutated genes play a role in, implying that these pathways are important for the pathophysiology of ALS and as targets for treatment. So, you know, we have the nucleocytoplasmic transport uh, where things go in and out of the nucleus and C9 is probably the most important gene to remember there. We have the way RNA and DNA is really metabolized and handled. Uh, and again, TDP43, FUS uh, and uh, C9 are uh, important there. We have protein aggregation or the way proteins are handled and uh, and discarded and, and metabolized, that there's a huge number of genes which play, which when mutated cause ALS and also play a role in protein homeostasis or protein uh, and protein aggregation. Neuroinflammation is yet another area of import and certainly uh, there are certain uh, genes which play a role here, TBK1, uh, is probably one of the most important ones, but also MCT and TREM2 play a role in, in pathways of uh, oligos and microglial function, which bears on support cells and, and neuroinflammation. And of course, we have mitochondrial function and oxidative stress. SOD1, our first gene ever identified, has a toxic gain of function, which increases oxidative uh, stress, but also it turns out C9 and TDP43 play a role here. And we all know that we have some newer drugs that target oxidative stress. We also have several drugs uh, in, in uh, trial that target neuroinflammation. Another uh, area of import is the vesicle transport and axonal uh, transport, as, as well as uh, the cytoskeleton. Of, of the uh, nerve cell. And so here you can see several genes that disrupt cytoskeleton and axonal transport and several that are uh, target uh, vesicle transport uh, defects. All of this important for neuronal function. And finally, it's cytotoxicity. So these give us several different areas that, that we can target. I mean, if you think of them, and condense them, it's neuroinflammation, it's RNA, DNA metabolism, uh, protein homeostasis uh, and, and aggregation, and really oxidative stress and mitochondrial function. Uh, and finally, vesicle transport, axonal transport, uh, and cytoskeleton, so that grouping uh, of pathophysiology. So let's talk a little bit about treatment in familial ALS and how uh, it informs uh, treatment. I've already alluded to the fact that these mechanisms can be targeted. We can study the mechanisms in animal models and IPS cells and mimic the disease and try to modulate the change. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to do the same thing in people. We typically think of two major mechanisms, a gain of function, which generally tends to be uh, a gene that has a mutation that's dominantly inherited, meaning the, that you only need one damaged gene. Remember that we inherit pairs of uh, chromosomes uh, and genes. One uh, set of our chromosomes comes from mom and one from dad. And so that in we have two copies of every chromosome and two copies of every gene. A chromosome has all the genes like a, a necklace. Um, of pearls, each pearl being uh, a gene. In autosomal dominant disorders, you only need one bad gene. 
uh, or one damaged gene. And these tend to be a toxic gain of function pathology. Uh, loss of function is typically recessive. That's where you need two damaged genes. And optoneuron and TBK1 are examples of recessively inherited uh, genetic abnormalities. We have identified toxic gain of function and a way to treat toxic gain of function by using strategies that will decrease the amount of protein made so that you decrease the amount of toxic protein. However, there's a caveat here because by decreasing the protein, you may also decrease some of the function of that protein. And there's some indication that while for instance, SOD1 and C9 are predominantly toxic gain of function mutations. There's also some loss of function. And if you further decrease function, there may be actually ramifications that you don't want when you treat someone. So we need to be cautious as we develop these treatments. And of course, in toxic gain of function, just to review something that I think you've already heard about, we use an anti-sense strategy where we use, uh, typically DNA is made into RNA, which then is translated into protein. By providing an anti-sense oligonucleotide, it will bind the RNA and prevent it from becoming protein and rather cause it to be degraded, thereby reducing the amount of the theoretically toxic protein. And this strategy is being used with SOD1 and also with C9, where the antisense is actually directed at that increased area of DNA that doesn't even code for protein, but codes for, for these dinucleotide repeat proteins that glom up the cells theoretically. And in FUS, in addition, I mentioned that uh, ataxin 2, which modifies disease if, if there's a little bit too much DNA, in that repeat region, and taxin has repeats, um, there's been an antisense strategy directed at that to see if it can modify disease in folks who carry that increased expansion. So moving on to ALS models, uh, these models can be cell-based. These are simple models. They can look at the function uh, associated with mutated genes or the effect those uh, genes have on proteins, uh, and also be a way to perturb cells and test drugs in a rapid throughput, throughput manner. And these include cell lines, budding yeast, and importantly, human-derived iPS cells, which gives us a human-based system. And in fact, there's been some evidence of reproduction of phenotype and pathologic change in iPS cells so that they uh, do show shortened survival, for instance, and they do show aggregation of proteins. Uh, however, it's not yet been shown how well they translate to, to human disease and inform us on treatment strategies, but that work is ongoing. In addition, uh, we can have small animals like C. elegans, the worm, zebrafish, flies. These are really nice because uh, they're easily genetically manipulable. So you can put in a genetic mutation, take it out, put in two mutations. They're relatively inexpensive compared to mouse and larger models and rapidly can be used in genetic screens to, to identify mutations and also to look at the consequences of those mutations and how to manipulate them. And larger animals more closely mimic human disease more complex, uh, and we can study pathogenic mechanisms and proof of concept. The promise of translating clinical effect of a drug in an animal model to people has not yet been proven, but we've been asking a model for SOD1 disease to do that, and I, I think that's almost unfair to the model. That model, however, was used in early anti-sense uh, development and showed an effect. And we're hoping that that does translate because that's a SOD1 disease to a SOD1 disease. And this just is to impress upon you all the different mutations that have been placed into these model systems and can be used for these types of studies. And 
uh, as you can see, everything from cell culture, iPS cells to mice and, uh, and uh, rats. And so we could talk briefly about rodent models uh, as, as we finish up. There have been rodent models uh, made for many of the genetic mutations, especially the more common ones, side one being the first and probably the most commonly used. And they really are a gold standard for preclinical ALS modeling of disease, not necessarily for translation of clinical effect. And we use them to study disease mechanisms, and they've certainly taught us a little bit about motor neuron degeneration. And in the SOD1 mouse, this is an overexpression model where we put mutated human SOD1 genetic material into the animal model, and we do multiple copies, 23 copies. The more we put in, uh, the worse those animals are. And, you know, as I mentioned, this animal model led to understanding gene silencing strategies using ASOs. For, for me, I have exploited this model to look for genetic modifiers. And it turns out that if I put that mutated human gene in different strains of mice, there's a different phenotype. The mouse has either a milder disease or a more severe disease. So on the background of SJL, there's a milder disease, uh, more severe disease rather, with earlier onset and shorter survival. Whereas in a black six, there is a later onset and longer survival. We used this uh, or leveraged this information to actually link the disease to a mouse chromosome in chromosome 17 in collaboration with Jack's laboratories. Both of us independently identified uh, this chromosomal location and worked to narrow the region. And once the region was narrowed, we then were able to identify what genes were in the region and could possibly play a role. And the way we do that is to identify the genes in the region, to look at the sequence in the mild versus the severe phenotype and see where there are differences and where those differences would result in abnormal protein, uh, an abnormal protein, and also which ones were previously reported to be important to motor neuron biology or ALS. We uh, have shared that list, and I'll talk about that in a moment when I talk about translating this information to people. But in addition, we wanted to make sure that this was not only important for SOD1 ALS, but more universally uh, applicable. And so we looked at another animal model of motor neuron disease, the Dynactin model, and in point of fact found out that yes, background did matter. And again, that SJL white mouse had a shorter survival, more severe disease, while the black six background had a milder disease. And we again went on and we've performed linkage studies and recently have linked this also to chromosome 17 and a similar region, suggesting that the modifiers will modify motor neuron degeneration in general, and not be specific for a particular mutation. We've shared these, the genes within these regions with our collaborators. We have uh, shared it uh, with Brian Trainer at the NIH so he can look at his GWAS studies, his genome-wide association studies for signals from our implicated genes in the ALS population versus controls. And we've also shared it with Molly Fetnani and her collaborators at the New York Genome Center, where they can examine DNA from ALS folks correlated with phenotype, the severe versus a milder phenotype for our implicated genes to see if they also uh, could be modifiers in humans and in people, as well as looking at CNS tissue from ALS folks that's segregated by uh, phenotype, more severe, uh, earlier onset, shorter duration versus later onset, longer duration, to see if there's any difference in the expression of our candidate genes. And we're hoping that we will translate what we've learned from the animal model to people. In conclusion, ALS is genetically complex. There our genetic influences in familial and sporadic ALS both, and up to 11, 15% of sporadic ALS carry mutated genes. And there are other influences besides just having that gene that influence your 
clinical picture. And these genes will continue to inform us about the pathophysiology of ALS, provide models for studying diseases, and direct treatment opportunities, both for genetic variants and sporadic. And we have to really understand the mutations and consider both gain and loss of function uh, mechanisms when, when we look at the therapy so we don't harm anyone and so that we produce an efficacious effect and don't knock a gene down so much that we lose more function and make people worse. So it does take caution, care, but the promise is there. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hyman Petson, for that very comprehensive genetic overview. So our next speaker, our final speaker, is actually Dr. Angela Gensch. Um, Dr. Genj has been the Executive Director of Clinical Research Unit at the Montreal Neurological Institute since 2004. Since 2020, she has also served as the Chief Medical Officer for Curalis and Scientific Director of Catalyst. Her expertise in groundbreaking work in the introduction of innovative therapies in the rare disease space has led her to be a sought after member of numerous advisory boards for companies developing therapies for these diseases. Clinically, she is the director of the Neuro ALS Clinical Program and Multidisciplinary Clinic and a neuromuscular neurologist. So I invite um, Dr. Gensch to speak about outcome measures in clinical trials in ALS, how to interpret recent results. Now, here are my disclosures. Why do, does uh, the choice of outcome measures matter in clinical trials? Well, it, it's been made a super clear this year that if you choose good outcome measures, and you design your trial well, you can demonstrate a positive effect in an ALS clinical trial. It has also become clear that we need better and more objective outcome measures in order to be able to confirm that a treatment that appears to be effective can be proven to be effective in a clinical trial. And the reason we have to do this is that in order for a drug or treatment to be approved, um, the FDA has to uh, review the data and they have an expectation of what will be included in order to prove that a drug is efficacious or works. EMA has their own guidance. This is the European group and their guidance also um, states clearly that we have to demonstrate uh, efficacy or benefit in order to get a drug approved. Uh, unfortunately for us in um, developing drugs in, AL in clinical trials, through clinical trials in ALS, the guidances are slightly different and uh, lead us into a situation where we have in some ways to choose the best um, clinical trial design for our molecule and then expect to present the results to both agencies uh, after the trial has been complete. So what's an outcome measure? An outcome measure is the result of a test that is used to objectively determine the baseline function of a patient at the beginning of treatment. This same instrument, outcome measure, can be used to determine progress and treatment efficacy. The importance of an outcome measure is that the statistical plan that is used to prove that a drug works is based on changes in known uh, validated outcome measures. Biomarkers are an additional component that has finally entered into ALS drug development. Biomarkers are a broad subcategory of medical signs or objective indications of the medical state observed from the outside, uh, from outside the patient, which can be measured accurately and reproducibly. Are there outcome measures that can be biomarkers? Are there biomarkers that can be outcome measures? 
Typically, outcome measures have some connection with the clinical state of the patient and are either derived through questionnaires or physical examination or technical examination, such as pulmonary function tests, in which you can demonstrate the function of a particular clinical organ. Biomarkers are typically um, tissue, either blood or cerebrospinal fluid or some other tissue um, that can be used to, to quantify a particular molecule, protein, um, or uh, part of the inflammatory system, for instance. Um, and this, this biomarker, because it is an objective measure and quantifiable, in that you get a number, it can be followed other, over time, and it's relatively easy to statistically analyze numbers, from, no matter where they're generated. There are biomarkers that are not from fluid, such as blood or cerebrospinal fluid, um, and there are um, outcome measures uh, and that can be perceived as biomarkers. Biomarkers themselves can definitely be outcome measures in clinical trials. And we know this best from, in fact, uh, oncology or cancer clinical trials, where most primary outcome measures are actually biological. Another piece of the background before I get into the clinical trials, neurofilaments. Neurofilaments have suddenly become a very hot topic in discussions around um, ALS clinical trials. However, neuro neurofilaments and the study of neurofilaments in ALS goes back at least three decades. And Dr. Bob Bowser actually has done a tremendous amount of work uh, turning measuring of neurofilament into a diagnostic test that can be used to confirm um, ALS in the clinic. And it has been now validated in uh, different ways um, as a biomarker and therefore a biological outcome measure in clinical trials. There is more than one neurofilament that is important in ALS. And that's a distinction that is really important. The first um, neurofilament to be identified as, as stable, elevated, and different than in ALS patients, than in patients who have what we call disease mimics, is neuro, uh, heavy chain neurofilament. And what Dr. Bowser and colleagues found was that measuring in the cerebrospinal fluid phosphorylated heavy chain neurofilament was an accurate way of identifying and following ALS patients. The other really important feature about um, these neurofilaments in the CSF and in the serum, of which there's a different one we think is most uh, validated in the serum, and that is that once the neurofilament is elevated, it is stable over time in patients who are not receiving treatment. That work has been done by Dr. Benatar, and his work has been um, the basis for something that I'll now talk about in terms of the Valor study. So I mentioned uh, CSF phosphorylated neurofilament filament heavy, uh, the first and best validated uh, neurofilament marker in ALS. The second validated uh, neurofilament marker is neurofilament light, and this has been validated in the serum. And uh, it is really the work of Dr. Mike Benatar in some longitudinal studies in patients with um, SOD1 mutations that has shown that we actually have a robust tool to use in clinical trials to follow um, evidence of um, biological improvement and therefore efficacy of a therapy. So 
I've, I've described outcome measures. I've described biomarkers. Now let's use these terms in um, the discussion of two different recent studies that have finished and also to reference of, of some ongoing studies. First, let's talk about valor. For everyone in the ALS community, this has been a hot topic. It is a trial that was finished by Biogen um, using something called an antisense oligonucleotide therapy. It's called Tofersen, and it, it's a treatment for people with familial ALS with a SOD1 mutation, and the treatment is given by a lumbar puncture. There was a study design that include fast progressing and non fast progressing patients. These, the non fast progressing patients are not slow progressors. They're simply not fast progressors. The study was designed to um, examine first and foremost the primary analysis of what happened in the fast progressing group through a variety of measures. The um, other components of this program uh, that are important are that there's an ongoing open label extension and that this study actually started with the very first in, in patient uh, trial, the phase one trial, several years ago. So there are actually patients who've been on this treatment now for a number of years. The of the uh, this trial is that it's the first trial to really robustly use both um, our most common primary outcome measure that of the ALS FRSR and biological measures um, in this case neurofilament levels and SOD1 levels to look at the effect of the treatment unfortunately the ALS FRSR did not show statistical significance in this trial um, during the course of the first six months. And um, several things happened in, in terms of the measurements of these primary outcome measures, but the statistical analysis was based on this measure in patients with the fast progressing form. So they did not meet their primary outcome measure in this in a, uh, statistically significant in a statistically significant manner. But what it did do, which is extremely important, is it actually showed an effect on what we all consider to be biologic biomarkers, and the one that really um, points out target engagement, and that is a clinical trial language for a drug actually hitting the target that it's supposed to hit. Um, in this case, target engagement was measured by levels of the protein SOD1 in the CSF, and as you can see from these graphs, uh, remember the solid lines are the treated patients and the dotted lines are the uh, patients on placebo, we see a very significant result in the faster progressing patients where the SOD1 levels were dramatically lowered uh, in the treatment group. Important. The neurofilament levels, and in this study they use the plasma neurofilament levels uh, using a very specific sensitive technique. And this is probably the most important result of all in this trial. It demonstrates a very significant response in all patients, sh showing a biologic effect in these patients. So all of you who follow uh, the news, Twitter, the results of uh, clinical trials, know that the um, ALS FRSR did not show the benefit. However, we saw target engagement that was very significant, an effect on what is uh, de developing into the most robust biomarker, uh, which uh, in this case we would expect would indicate um, 
a positive benefit of the treatment and with other data that I've not shown uh, would uh, also indicate a long-term benefit of the therapy. And we um, also uh, noted in the results that have been presented by Dr. Miller and will be presented again next week by Dr. Miller that the, non, the non-fast progressive patients have done remarkably well in the open label extension. So although we did not meet the primary outcome measure, which was ALS FRSR, we met some very, very important other endpoints that lead us to hope to continue to use this, this therapy in patients with SOD1 mutations. It has triggered an important uh, discussion, and that is the use of the ALS FRSR as a primary me outcome measure and how we can make this outcome measure uh, more robust or improve um, its utility in, in drug development in ALS. There's another trial that actually was designed completely differently and actually demonstrated a benefit to the ALS FRSR. This trial was a small trial and it finished last year. Um, we've had the data now for over a year. It's the Centaur trial by Amalex. And what they were able to demonstrate in a very different population of patients, they had only rapidly progressing patients um, and their uh, trial design uh, really used a primary outcome measure of the ALS FRSR and um, other clinical outcome measures, strength and respiratory function. And they were able to demonstrate a benefit on the slope of decline of the ALS FRSR. So the primary endpoint in this study was also the ALS FRSR, but they were able to benefit and uh, demonstrate an improvement um, by demonstrating a slowing of the decline of function in the patients treated with a AMX0035. The survival uh, analysis, which was um, continued into the open label extension period, showed a significant positive impact of AMX0035 on survival in patients with ALS. Um, that impact was considered to be up to, up to uh, six months um, in patients who received AMX0035 from the beginning of the original trial. Due to the timing of this trial, biomarkers were not a major piece of the trial. However, there is a new trial that has just started in the U.S. and Europe called Phoenix, um, which is a longer trial uh, in order to meet the European re regulatory requirements. And this trial um, will have included in it a broader patient population and more biomarker uh, endpoints. So at the end of Phoenix, we will have additional information on AMX0035. In the meantime, uh, Amalex has been able to submit to both Health Canada and the FDA to request approval of AMX0035 for sporadic patients, um, patients with sporadic ALS. So the most important reason for this particular trial is to demonstrate that uh, a new therapy is safe in one patient. Why am I highlighting it? Because in fact, that's how the big international trial to treat patients with the FUS mutation began. Dr. Neil Snyder used this path in order to get enough evidence to encourage Ionis to run what is now one of the most important uh, clinical trials in an ultra rare form of ALS, those with the FUS mutation. So what else uh, should we know about? Well, we should know about 
uh, things like courage. Courage is the uh, cytokinetics trial, and courage um, is a trial using a drug relaceptive that targets the muscle. It has an outcome measure that is hand grip strength. That outcome measure is a strength measure. It has an additional outcome measure, uh, HHD Megascore, again looking at strength. It's truly an outcome measure, but it actually, because the drug is targeting the muscle, is a form of a, of a biomarker because of the direct target of the relative to the muscle fibers themselves. It will, it's not yet categorized as biomarkers, and the, the trial will also capture biomarker samples for future biomarker analysis, but we look forward to seeing the results of the strength testing, which is quite quantitative, in this study called Courage. So I've talked about several different trials. I've talked about um, outcome measures, and I've briefly reviewed biomarkers. The most important takeaways here are really that all aspects of a clinical trial need to be evaluated and analyzed. So a primary outcome measure and any biomarker type outcome measures are important in all ALS clinical trials. Clinical trials should actually include now multiple uh, biomarkers in addition to the ALS FRSR and survival, and in addition to uh, pulmonary function tests and, and various forms of strength testing. What we do need is to encourage everyone listening to participate in treatment trials and observational trials that will be uh, used to further validate biomarkers and outcome measures because all of our objective is to find treatments that will turn ALS into a chronic disease. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, um, Dr. Gensch. So we now will have all three speakers um, on the panel. And I'm just gonna start. Thanks very much for joining us, everyone. You could have yourself um, off mute, please, Dr. Hyman Petson as well. <laughs> okay, right. I'm going to start off by asking um, each of you the same sort of question. So the first one, I'll start with Dr. Hardeman. Um, you, you know, you've obviously got lots of projects going on. Is there any project in particular that is a pet project that you would like to share with us that you're currently working on in the clinic? Yes, there is actually. Um, so I I completely agree with my two colleagues, and I, I think it's it's interesting that we all kind of took the same tack on our presentations. We didn't confer in advance, and we all think that genetics, genetic modelling, using genetics to model disease, disease heterogeneity, the variability of the disease, and the really important value of biomarkers, and and that the subject is the person, you know. So, so um, Terry has done phenomenal and really important and interesting work um, over the years, and she's a, a, a giant in, 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 in translational research, um, and her work has been really, really important, bringing it into the human domain and, and, and the, the, the work that she's done on the, the, um, the mouse modeling and, and identifying this genetic variability is, is really, really important. What we're trying to do in, in our center is we really to to um to, to think about the person with the disease as as the as the as the the the, the um exploratory subject if you if you like and and that we apply the same rigor to humans with the condition as we would in, in a laboratory setting um and one of the things we've been really look at thinking about is the is is there some way of getting at the variability of the disease using two modalities? One is genomics and genetics and looking at ancestral origin, and that's really important. The other is looking at pathways within the brain. So one of the things that Terry said was that the, the human iPS cell, the induced pluripotent stem cell, 
um, doesn't necessarily it, it recapitulates some of the disease. But our view, which we've evolved over the years, is that you probably need a functioning brain and a functioning nervous system to be really able to model this disease properly. And of course, it doesn't occur naturally in the animal world. It's a, it's a human disease. So what are the best ways to get at that? Now, there are two obvious ways, three really, the, 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 what Angela has been talking about, the wet biomarkers. But there are also there are imaging, so brain, way, brain um, MRI scans, but um, they're very expensive and, and people have to lie down flat and that can be very challenging. Or brainwave activity. And we've become really interested in looking at brainwave activity, the neurophysiology, the electrical patterns that are going on in our brains all the time. And could these be different in ALS and can we capture them? And so the answer is yes, they are. And yes, yes, we can. And not only can we capture them, but we can subdivide people with ALS into different subcategories just based on the patterns of disruption of their brain networks. So we've been working really hard on that over the last few years and, and have really made some really interesting and, and I think quite important observations. Um, not only so some work that we published in, in one of the big journals recently, a journal called Brain, showing this, but also we have some presentations at the symposium looking at whether this pattern change happens even before people develop the, the condition, if they have, for example, a C9 or 72 variant, and the answer is yes, you can. So that's an area we're really interested in. We're, we're interested in the signal patterns of the brain and the nervous system, and also how the brain talks to the muscles. Um, so all, all of the different methodologies that we can use to measure this. And we think this is something that's going to be really important in the future and that Angela will be using in the future in the studies that she is designing. And I think that'll get incorporated in the next 10 years into the into as a as a credible and valuable quantitative, in other words, we're not relying on my prowess as a clinician, but a a a a, a, a data driven measure of disease um of how the disease is is pre present present and and and, and a sort of a, 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 a the neck the, the a, a, a proximal evaluation of what's happening at a biological or neurobiological level within the neural axis okay thanks very much dr Longerman. if i could pose the same question to dr hyman petson oh, well um let me first say mm -hmm. what a privilege it is to be on the dais with Orla and Angela, these these are two giants uh, in in the ALS, and so I, I'm humbled by being here. Um, I, I I'm going to take a different tack. What Orla is doing is extremely important, and I I wish I had something as, as fancy going on. But but what one of my passions is, um, in addition to genetics and and uh, research and clinical research is, is leveraging technology. And so the, the program that I'm excited about in the clinic is, is our program on brain computer interfaces, which is really leveraging things that are available now and putting together systems for, I hope, under $5,000 that will use brain, brain computer interfaces to actually communicate to run Google Home and even a power wheelchair. And, and we've made some progress in, in beta tests, in starting to beta test the systems where we're actually using things you can buy online now and putting them together and doing the software design to interface the different pieces of hardware. And so hopefully next year, I'll be able to talk a little bit about some progress there. And I think some of our work was presented in posters at Allied Health, but that that's my excitement is to improve the quality of life and use the tools we have now to make life better. I think that's critical. Okay, great. Thanks, um, Dr. Hyman Petson. And the same question to Dr. Gange. Anything new, exciting that you're doing in your lab? <laughs> Other uh, than well, my lab is, is the clinical research unit, so it's not exactly a lab. Um, yeah, I'm the, that is really what I do. Um, and it is great to share the, share this with Orla and Terry. We, um, there are a couple of things. We are working on a uh, guidelines internationally for genetic testing, because if we don't know that you have a genetic disease, 
a form of ALS, then you can't be offered the therapies for the genetic form. So I think we've all firmly uh, believe that we are still missing patients who could uh, take advantage of some of these uh, super advanced opportunities in therapy. Um, and without a formal genetic testing um, guideline, uh, many places cannot get access. So particularly if you work in a public health system, um, and that's a good part of the uh, world, although it doesn't apply to Terry um, completely, although, you know, Medicare and Medicaid and the VA would probably use these kinds of guidelines. There's a U.S. centric uh, program happening and we've pulled together the rest of the world. Um, um, the aim is to have a tool that people can use to get the kind of support they need to get routine genetic testing in the ALS clinics. I say that's one really important. Um, and the second really important piece, and it's nowhere again as, as, uh, as groundbreaking as what Orla has been doing um, with her biomarker work, but it is really trying to get um, our outcome measures looked at differently. Um, my new passion, which you'll hear about again next week, um, is to really take the ALS FRSR by both hands and shake it until it's better. Um, it's not a bad thing, really, um, and it's a very useful tool in clinic, but we're asking it to do more than it can do in its current state. So uh, we really need to sort of refine it to a, a one set of questions, properly um, translated, look at what's creating the variability, get rid of as much variability as we can, and really have it all under one umbrella. Um, and I am basically going to be pushing these colleagues on the screen with me and a few others. Uh, to truly help get this done, because my concern is if we don't do it, someone else will, and we may not agree with what a private enterprise could do to the ALS FRSR. So we're better to get it on it together. Um, I had a patient advocacy group reach out and talk to me about this as well. So it's a really, really important thing for drug development. Okay. Um, so I think those are my two biggest. Great. Um, that's, yeah. Thanks for that, because that then brings us to a question that's come through from the public um, in the chat group. Um, so basically, it's it's asking about the biomarkers. You know, what is what you were saying about the ALS FRSR? We're probably wanting to move away from that. So how far do you think we are from having a biomarker that? You know, not just FDA, but any drug regulatory body would actually accept as a surrogate endpoint. And also what kinds of work needs to be done for that to be recognized by the different, you know, not just the FDA, but, you know, everywhere around the world, basically. And maybe we could start with, well, um, Dr. Gensch, do you want to take that one? Because you, that specifically touches on what you've just discussed. So I will, and then I'll let the others have their important comments as well. Um, I think we will know as some of the current trials finish and go to the regulatory bodies. Um, survival is the outcome measure that um, the Europe uh, in large part requires. And so we're not looking just for uh, a replacement or an adjustment to ALS FRSR. And I'm hoping what we're moving towards is outcome measures of biomarkers that can be a, a proper combined assessment with survival and, uh, and with a refined ALS FRS. Um, and I think we have the opportunity to educate the regulators. The regulators don't want to block good drugs. They just want to be able to evaluate the drugs properly using endpoints that are objective clear and if we use biomarkers that the biomarkers actually reflect the clinical disease that's what they want they're not the bad guys they just need us to help them and that's how i look at it um so i think we're not far 
Okay. But I think we have to do it together. Right. Dr. Hardiman, do you want to give us your feedback yeah. on that? Yeah, I, I think there are two things. One, we have to decide what a bio, you know, what biomarkers do, do different things. There's a biomarker of disease onset. You know, there's a biomarker that says this is ALS versus this is not ALS. And then there's a biomarker, as Angela said, that should map onto what the drug is doing. And there's, there's a biomarker then of what the disease is doing. And obviously they may be linked. Um, my view is that um, I, I don't think that we're there yet with any of the biomarkers that we have. I, I think neurofilaments are, are, you know, are very interesting and exciting, but I don't think we're there yet um, because neurofilaments are, are elevated in other diseases as well. The, the second thing is that I think we're going to probably have an array of biomarkers. I think ALS is more than one disease. I'm, in fact, I'm convinced of it. And and uh, I think that what we want to do is is be able to segregate patients into the different subgroups. And I think we are going to need some kind of biomarker because clinically we're not able to do that. So genomics you know, can be a biomarker. So the work that Terry is doing is very important because that will help us to segregate people. That's a biomarker of disease category. c 9 off repeat expansion is a biomarker of disease subtype. So uh, then there are many, many different types of wet biomarkers, but these are bio, bio, biochemical or protein signals within the, the blood or the spinal fluid, and they may be helpful. But I think we'll be looking at arrays. And, and in fact, the cartoon that I put up at the end, this precision ALS um, path, um, machine that we're building, the idea there is that we'll, we'll have some kind of um, methodology at scale to be able to segregate patient, patients in subgroups using data-driven markers, both of disease onset and disease progression. So I don't think we're there yet. I think it'll be an array of different technologies. I think we're going to have to unpick the disease. We've done that to some extent with SOD1 and C9 and the other uh, rarer types of genomics, but there's a lot more to do. You know, ALS is associated with cognitive change in some people, but not in everybody. The types of behavioral change we see are different in different people as well. So there's a lot more work to do. Much of it, I think, is informed by the sort of work that Terry is doing, because I do think there are genomic signals. The, the heritability of ALS is about 0.5. So about half of the risk for developing ALS is, is in our genes. So we need to understand that. OK. And Dr. Hyman Petson, anything you want to add to that? It's hard to add to that. I, I would. I would or anything new. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, um, you know, this was very thorough, and I think that one of the issues is going to be, uh, as we do personalized medicine, I think underscoring the fact that the biomarkers may be different depending on the subgroup, and um, I'm wondering if, just to add to the mix, and Orla would probably agree with me that that uh, sequencing of the whole genome for each individual is going to be a, an important part of the biomarkers, if you will. And, and each trial is going to have to be designed very thoughtfully about not only a biomarker of uh, effect on disease, which would correlate, as Angela pointed out, with disease progression. You want a clinical biomarker or, or a biochemical biomarker, but also biomarkers of target engagement and to interpret data, the genome, to know what influences other genes might have had on the effect. So. Yeah. We, we need to be cognizant as well, given that we're in four corners of the world here. That, yeah. that you know, we, you know, we, we are yeah. very European ancestor population centric, and there are parts of the world where C9 often yeah. isn't important at all. For example, in Malaysia, SOD1 yeah. is important in Malaysia. So we need to be we need to be cognizant of this. There are other genes in other parts of the world. So so yeah. you know, the idea that we can target a gene and fix the disease. Um, the, 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 and the whole genome sequencing, we don't know enough about the genomics of outside of European populations, really. And so there's a lot of work to do there just to characterize what's important, what isn't, what's real and what isn't, you know, what's actually pathologically important and what isn't. And that's a really important endeavor that, that's going to take some time, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So that takes me to my question, <laughs> because, you know, I, I am coming from a resource, not, you know, resource limited setting. Uh, I don't know whether, you know, this was going to bound to come up if you have me moderating. So how do we see, you know, what we have now is really largely, you know, as, as, um, as cat, 
Yeah, that's your cat. <laughs> um, so, so Dr. Hardiman spoke about, you know, how a lot of data is coming really from the Caucasian population. And we know that this is, you know, multi-step. There are lots of different factors that are at play. So how can the ALS community such as yourself, who have done all this amazing research, how can you bring in the rest of the world you know, people like myself um, and, and also with, with Dr. Genj, you know, I think, you know, we had one communication where, you know, I tried to get a patient into the clinical trial. Um, you know, how do we get the clinical trials to, you know, the, the rest of the world? So, so I, you know, maybe we can start with, with maybe uh, Dr. Genj with that. Is there anything that you think that the community can do towards that? Uh, great, great question, Martina. Um, we're actually looking much more frequently at getting trials um, outside of North America and on a number of projects that I'm on um, for exactly the reasons uh, that we brought up. The um, Sometimes a challenge is very silly, to use a, a normal word, um, the challenge is that the CRO finds it difficult to work in multiple time zones. Now, that's a really silly reason to choose a country um, or not choose it for um, an, an ALS clinical trial, uh, but it's the reality. So a lot of it has to do with uh, those of us, myself, Orla, Terry, others, who actually talk very directly with the with the uh, pharma that are developing the drugs and really encouraging them to look beyond their usual um, usual suspects um, and get the trials into into Asia, the Asia Pacific Rim in particular. Um, the more I um, work with people who are not in North America and Western Europe, the more I realize that there's a tremendous potential and it's not that difficult. But really, it, a lot of the time, it's not um, a lack of interest on the sponsor side. Um, it is um, the CRO and how they see the logistics. So we just really have to overcome a barrier that, that is a little bit unseen. Um, that's, that's really where I see the bigger barrier. Yeah, I wanted to actually also ask Dr. Hardiman and Dr. Hyman Patterson. I mean, that is one aspect, which is the clinical trials, but there are also the other aspect, which is, you know, you talk about precision medicine. And for that, you know, you want to be having patients with, you know, similar kind of like genetic uh, predisposition, uh, exposure to environmental factors. And to do that, you, you really need the rest of the world. So how would you see that? I mean, for instance, Project Mine. I mean, when I look at Project Mine, I see, you know, there's obviously so much has come out of that, but there are a lot of countries missing there. So how do we move forward with this? Yeah, so, so there are two parts to that, actually, um, Martina. Project Mine is a first world initiative in a way, if you think about it, because the, the Project Mine genome sequencing is paid for by the countries that donate the DNA. So we had to raise the money in yeah. Ireland to sequence the, the, the samples from Irish patients. And then that goes into the, the, the mix of, of Project Mine. So cool. it is a problem. I, I, I think um, I think you're right. I, I think it's like the dementia project, the 1066 project. 66% uh, of dementia work is epidemiologic work is done in 10% of the population of the world and ALS is no different. And and I think what I think the Alliance is a fantastic vehicle to talk about this actually. Um, I've had the privilege of, of um, engaging with colleagues in, in, in Latin America and in the Caribbean. So we, we received some funding from the American Center of Disease Control to conduct an epidemiologic study or, and to start building collaborative work um, in, in Latin America. It's called the LANALS project. It's just, it's just finished. So we have a Latin American database now. Uh, and anybody from Latin America who's 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 interested in engaging in ALS epidemiologic research, we'd be delighted to talk to them. So I think I think it's that sort of thing. It's it's uh, it's working with centres and sites um, outside of the mainstream European and North American and Australian um, regions that have money, and trying to 
trying to draw down resourcing from those parts of the world that are well resourced to support parts of the world that, that are not well resourced. So this is a, a global question. Of course, you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic. And yeah. if you look at the map of vaccinations, it's no different. And yeah. so this is a this is a an equity, global equity problem in general. It's not just relating to ALS. But I think you know we need to be mindful of this. It's a rare disease. We're a small group. We all know each other. This is something we should be able to do if we work collectively. So, so I, I think it is something that we need to pay attention to. We are excluding a large swathe of people in the world, and I don't think that's I don't think that's equitable. Yeah, Dr. Hyman Petson, anything you want to also comment on? Well, uh, I I think all all of the above, everything everybody said, and in addition, the development of the core groups like. Meals and cows and pack tails, you know, these groups can also leverage each other and work together. And, and don't yeah. forget Lainals. Lainals is the Latin American one now. Yeah. yeah. Thank That's you, good. Orla. No, and, and so the, these groups should be having a discourse on how everybody can be elevated and to Orla's point that, you know, we, yeah. we leverage all of the resources across the board because what helps others is going to help us too so what we learn from other populations yeah absolutely um and i think one of the things i wanted to also add is that you want everyone to be on the same page you know collecting information in a similar way um but something that's realistic in the real world for countries that you know that that may not be able to do for instance you know the ankles prediction model, I mean, that's wonderful, but realistically, you know, not everybody can do a C9 off 72, which is within that model, for instance. So I think, you know, there, there must be ways where there is minimum information that will be useful and, and it'll be nice for, for, you know, so for instance, for myself, you know, I, you know, because we, we, we are always constantly looking to see what's happening, but, but not everybody's doing that. So, you know, we want to know that we're collecting the correct things so that we can actually collaborate with other people. Um, so I think it'd be nice to have everybody kind of like come into well, this. Well, well the, uh, Martina, the reality of the of the prediction model is actually, you know, it was built from European registers and C9 is important in Europe. Yeah. In parts of the world where it's not, you know, the, the, gen, the genomic signature of other parts of the world may, may be the determinant there. So. I think knowing your population is really important um, yeah. and, and, and under, understanding what the factors are. You know, we don't know enough about LS outside of European populations. Probably, it is probably more common in populations of European extraction. Um, but the, gen the phenotype, the characteristics of the disease are, are probably different in other parts of the world. We just, you know, we don't know about, for example, the Indian subcontinent and, and probably what does come out there, it does suggest that maybe different subtypes and phenotypes and possibly better outcomes in, in, in some cohorts within the Indian um, population, sub sub subcontinent. So I think I think we need more data and, and I think those data have to be generated locally so that the questions that we're asking are, are pertinent and relevant to the populations that we're studying locally. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for that. So I'm going to go back to, um, you know, enough about me. <laughs> Let's just get to, get to the, some of the questions that are coming through. So this one is asking about the role of exercise and how it can help maintain function. Maybe we can ask Dr. Gensch um, on that one, based on your clinical um, expertise. So that's question number six. A great question. Um, there, the person who's published on this is uh, is a neurologist colleague of ours, uh, Nick Maragakis, out of Johns Hopkins. And my thinking and the thinking in the field has evolved over time. There was a time when we told everybody, don't exercise at all. Um, and as you know, that's almost impossible for patients with ALS, as many of them are quite active right prior to getting ALS, right? Um, so the current, my current recommendations are exercise as you would like, but monitor your own response to exercise. Don't take up weightlifting if you've never done weightlifting. And even if you have, be 
be really cognizant of what you're doing to your muscles, but definitely keep your cardio and, and the exercise that you can do without um, causing yourself profound fatigue, which usually translates into, uh, translates into soul injury, um, you should do. That's my, uh, my normal advice. I don't know if Orla or Terry tend to give other advice, but that's what I tell people. Okay, so there's a question here about whether a person with the ALS could assess ALS FRS by themselves, but I think that is correct. They can do that themselves. So that's fairly straightforward, that one. Yes. So there's um, um, so there is a question which is, um, okay, I'm gonna put it in a different way. So we've got, you know, we've talked about biomarkers, we've talked about antisense oligonucleotides. You know, these are things that are, you know, oligo, uh, antisense oligonucleotides are coming through and that's gonna be very helpful. And of course, you've got the stem cell also coming through and, and you know, there's been disappointment obviously with the neuron. But I think we want to just move forward and get your your thoughts about how we can move forward with these two particular promising drug, um, uh, well, promising approach to management. So maybe we could start with Dr. Hyman Patterson. So we're talking about antisense oligonucleotides and also stem cell therapy with regards to management treatment in the future. Well, you know what? Obviously, from my talk, I think AntiSense is extremely uh, exciting, and it can, that strategy has been used in other diseases successfully, and uh, should and it's moving forward in in ALS. Uh, we just have to be cognizant of the caveats, uh, but I, I think it's very exciting, and I, and I think the way forward is is clear. There's more work being done and more studies, um, and in, and not only to a person, there's an anti-sense directed at the extra DNA in C9 and that a taxon I mentioned. So these are studies that are ongoing. And I think that the horse is out of the barn and we're going to see more and more uh, of these. And in fact, personalized, like with the FUS projects. Now, this was really personalized medicine for someone with a FUS mutation. So, and so I think that, you know, these, these are going to be uh, coming forward. Uh, stem cells, we have to understand what they're doing. And I, I think that work is also ongoing uh, to leverage the, the findings to date and to, to really know whether or not we're, we're doing anything. Um, and, and I think it's going to take some rehashing of data in the trials, not only neuron, but the other stem cell type of trials that have happened. And, and I don't think that uh, we're, <laughs> that it's gone yet. I think that there will be more studies going forward as we understand better what happened in the ones that were done. You have to look where we've been so that we can look ahead and, and learn, learn from, from what we've done. So uh, I hope that answered the question. Okay, did, um, did anyone else want to add to what Dr. Kevin Petson had said? Not really. <laughs> okay, right. We'll we'll move on to the next question. Is about Project Mind. Maybe Dr. Hardiman, um, does it collect phenotypes of PELS as well? Yes, it does. It does yeah. So that's quite straightforward. And then the other question is, of course, about um, whether the global pandemic experience may have altered the CRO mindset. I don't quite know how one answers that. Any 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 thoughts on that? I think the CRO will just do whatever they want. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Um, not again. Or are you talking about Project Minor? You feel you've said everything you want to say? I, I mean, I, I, I think Project Mind does collect phenotypes. Um, you know, yeah. I, I think Precision ALS, the new initiative, TriCALS, will be collecting a, a, a great deal more information about patients. And the plan would be that we'll link that up with Capture ALS, which is the Canadian project, and and also the... the um, Answer ALS, which is US based, and, and some of the other um, uh, large scale uh, studies that are underway. So, so the idea will, will be that we will link up um, the genomic data with very detailed clinical information. But we, we collect, because Project Mine um, is linked, certainly in Europe, to our ALS registers, we have some core information on people um, 
not probably as much as we should, but but there is there is phenotypic data there. But but we need more. We need a lot more to be able to segregate people into subtypes. Absolutely. So that's great. The, so the um, no CROs actually don't always have the final say, Martina. <laughs> so don't don't be so discouraged. You know I'm not. Um, and I oh, that wasn't never, my question though. <laughs> I never give up. Um, I, it's a part of the problem uh, that I have. I'm getting treatment for it. But um, I think the thing, the biggest tool, mm -hmm. is what you're already doing in Asia with Pactels and what the Orla is referencing in Latin America. The biggest tool is creating a network and getting, and it doesn't have to be a hundred sites. It can be one strong site per country or two str or three strong sites per country. It just, the, the impetus has to be creating that clinical trial site um, ability. And there's a few different ways to do that um, because on on our on our side, um, whether it's uh, whether I'm talking as 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 just a consultant and and giving random advice, or whether I'm more involved in the program, we're really actively looking for for opportunities to take um, new clinical trials into regions other than. Um, and I'm not being pejorative, Terry, but other than the U.S. Um, <laughs> U.S. has tons. Um, but if you have a really strong site in Singapore or Malaysia, you don't need 100 sites in Singapore or Ma Malaysia. You need one strong site. And yeah, we'll that is Malaysia. enough. <laughs> what? We can have it in Malaysia. <laughs> right. But, but that's enough to get a, yeah. get a trial into a country. Right. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, and that's kind of my thinking. Um, yeah. And I think the best example I have is the uh, growth of South Korea as a clinical trial site. Yeah. And and Dr. Kim's um, clinic is extremely important for us who are, are involved in any of the SOD1 programs because there's a high incidence of SOD1 genetic mutations in South Korea, and he has developed a very strong clinical trial site. So even though the CROs may not bring up South Korea, I do every time because okay. I know that he can do exactly what is needed for the program and, um, and, he, and his site can do it well. So that's all they want. They just, they just um, don't like the inconvenience <laughs> of having, but you know, it's all about getting good patients and get it, running a trial well. So, yeah. Can, can I jump up. in there? Because we were we were an underdeveloped country in Ireland for a long time, and okay. until we joined the EU. Um, but but um, we Ireland had a terrible reputation of getting trials in. It still still doesn't have a great reputation. By the way, a CRO is a clinical research organization. Oh, so it's, it's, a, it's a it's the middle people. Who conduct the trial? The drug company will 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 um, contract a centre or, or a, a company that'll that'll then help to to drive the trial. Uh, and the key to to uh, building trials is, as Andrew said, it's it's to demonstrate excellence, and anybody can do that. You need somebody like um, Nor Nortine in, in 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 Malaysia, or or you know um, Matthew Kearn in, in Australia. Matthew's put Australia on the map. Or Angela in Canada, you know. I mean, the U.S. has has Niels, which was which was Terry was was chair of Niels for a while. So you need some strong leadership, and you need excellence. And that doesn't have to be geographically anywhere. You can be as yeah. long as you have strong leadership, good good um, very good data, um, and a demonstrable excellence. You can do this anywhere. It, it's about excellence, and that 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 doesn't have to be um, it doesn't have to be anywhere. In particular, you need you just need people there to do it. You know that's all you need. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for that. So I think before we we end this, I I ought to just go back to the question, the first question on the board, which is really if I could ask maybe Dr. Gensch first with regards to the MLX approval. Um, there's uh, a sure. Um, so MLX has submitted 
uh, to Health Canada for approval. We are expecting uh, the outcome from Health Canada as late as June of 2022 because they, they were given a, three, uh, a regular review. However, we uh, may get the result much sooner than that. And okay. so they've been, um, Health Canada has accepted their application for approval for their drug in Canada on the basis of the Centaur uh, data. Um, Centaur was the name of the clinical trial that showed the benefit of AMX0035. And Health Canada is not at this point requiring the information from the Phoenix clinical trial, which is the one that's currently starting in Europe and, and the US. Um, so we will know in the new year. Uh, the latest possible is June, but maybe much earlier than that. Okay. Um, and also, Dr. Hardiman, the question was also with regards to Ireland. In terms of yeah, so we're, we're, we're part of the European Union, uh, unlike our nearest neighbor, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, the uh, I don't think um, Amelix has actually submitted to the okay. EMEA. Uh, but in, in any event, uh, the the trial was quite small. It was a small number of patients, and it was it was LSFRS slope. Um, so we would like to see in Europe a larger trial. So it's not just the regulators; those of us who live in Europe would like to, and the UK would like to see a um, a larger phase three trial with with a much lasting much longer. The the phase two, the, what we would see as as the outcome is being very. Um, uh, it, 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 it's it's a uh, a study that that looks very interesting, but but uh, we would like to see more data. So we 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 are happy to progress to the Phoenix study and generate a large data set. Um, so it's encouraging, but but we would support the MEA in in the request for for a larger phase three clinical trial. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, I think we better call it. Uh... <laughs> I put an end to this, but thank you so much to our three fantastic speakers. You know, it just so happens that, you know, for me, it's like it's an all female panel, so it's quite empowering. <laughs> and I'm quite encouraged to end, you know, um, and I take heart to all your advice with regards to how we can move forward anywhere around the world. You just need to just get in there and just continue to push on. And it's encouraging to hear that all of you will support. Um, anyone out there who's doing it for, you know, the greater good for the patients with ALS and MND. Um, with that, um, I think, um, Kathy, do you want to come in? I'm not sure what we do now, but thank you to all the speakers. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have uh, extreme gratitude to express here. Uh, Nortina, thank you so much uh, for moderating ALS MND Connect. Thank you so much uh, to our esteemed panelists. Uh, that was a fantastic couple of hours um, hearing just a taste of what's going to happen at the uh, research symposium next week in terms of what's on the horizon. Uh, I love the title of Dr. Hardiman's um, uh, presentation that we have reason for hope. Um, and uh, I feel a strong sense of that right now. I would uh, especially like to thank our, our three ALS MD Connect sponsors, Brainstorm, Biogen, and Amelix uh, for their support of the International Alliance to be able to bring ALS MD Connect uh, to the whole world through um, our Alliance meeting, through our Allied Professionals Forum, and through Facebook Live. Um, the recording will live on Facebook Live, uh, and uh, we will also be posting it to our YouTube channel um, shortly. Um, I just wanted to um, say thank you for the uh, very robust conversations you had about accessibility, about biomarkers, about genetics. Uh, those are all conversations that are happening at the global level that are so important to our community. Um, and especially about global collaboration uh, as we all work towards our uh, goal of a world free of ALS MND. And my last thank you goes to Dr. Felipe Ocampo, who started us off um, with uh, his story of his journey uh, and uh, gave us, um, you know, the foundation of why this research uh, that everyone is undertaking is so important. So thank you, everyone. 
and uh, thank you again, Nortina, for your fantastic moderation of ALS MND Connect 2021. My pleasure. All right, thanks, Kathy, as well.